Hello, everybody. Bendala Tunji here. Welcome to the concluding part of the regulatory environment. The expectation gap. What is expectation gap? Expectation gap, simply put, is the difference between what the person or the clients that engage the service of an auditor expects or thought he or she or the organization will get by engaging the work or by engaging the auditor but not knowing what actually the auditor by regulation and standard ought to do so expectation gap comes as a result of not knowing or not knowing enough about the audit environment how audits really work by engaging auditor so when somebody engage the service of a practitioner and do not know enough about what the practitioner supposed to do by virtue of training, by virtue of qualification, by virtue of standard in which the auditor is operating within. Then we will say there is an expectation gap. Various elements can make this vacuum to be observed between what auditor ought to deliver and what the client that engaged him or her thought they should receive or get by engaging the service of an auditor and basically we break it into three types the elements are broken into three parts that could cause expectation gap to arise fundamentally it could be a standard gap we have also a performance gap and we have also a liability gap so the gap could be caused by standard it could be as a result of performance and it could be a liability gap so we take them one after the other what is a standard gap what is a standard gap a standard gap actually occurs when what auditor supposed to do by virtue of training by virtue of standard like the IASs the IFRS and the like and what the client thought should be done differs so that is a standard gap the performance gap happens when the client thought or observed that the auditor has performed below expectation in form of delivery and this is actually a peculiar one because this is an area of expectation gap in which if truly the client that engage our service is able to actually prove that we perform poorly in delivery it could lead to serious liability it could lead to serious liability when performance gap is actually proven to be correct in the court of law the last of the liability the last of the expectation gap rather is the liability gap and this comes up as a result of when somebody believes that auditor is responsible to to them whereas auditor may not be liable to them by reason of law so that is liability gap 
This arises from a lack of understanding about the auditor's liability and who the auditor may really be liable to. Among the three gaps that we just discussed, paramount attention must be paid to performance gap because it could lead to either criminal professional liability or civil liability. These are the types of liability that auditor could have. It could be criminal in nature and it could be civil in nature. So among the three, paramount attention must be paid to the performance gap and as much as possible, auditor must ensure that is actually closed up. So how can we close expectation gap? You will look at the definition very well. We will observe that the gap is as a result of expectation not being met and the like. And fundamentally, closing it requires education. Closing the gap requires education, information from the part of the auditor being engaged. Also from the part of the professional body. Education, enlightenment is required. So on the part of the auditor, auditor from the onset must educate the client about what to expect and what audit is meant for and what audit will look at, what audit is not. And the medium of this enlightenment given to the client is using the vehicle of management letter using the ma using the vehicle of engagement letter rather the engagement letter must be given from the onset which detail our knowledge about what we are engaged to do and how we are going to execute it so that is the engagement letter why the clients will give us the appointment letter for appointing us, we must educate them and close the gap of their expectation by ensuring we give them sufficient information on what they should expect from us as a result of the audit engagement. Also, from the part of the profession, from the part of the profession, the professional body too must ensure that they educate the auditor in form of the practitioner and set standard. They must ensure standard is set and that is why usually we have all these mandatory compulsory educational training being run by the institute so that auditors keep updating their knowledge. So we we'll see that on, on two parts now, the auditor must educate the client, the profession must educate the auditor. So the auditor must ensure that relevant information is given to the client so that the expectation gap will be closed. Likewise also, the provision must give rules of engagement, procedure, how to execute field work, audit related work and the like. Guidance must be given as a professional body so that when the practitioner goes when the practitioners go out, they go out to deliver with everything they've learned and they will be able to perform better on the field.
current information, latest idea, technology, and everything, technical know-how. All must be given and retraining, relearning must be provided continuously. On the part of the auditor, auditor must let his clients know that auditors are not meant to look for fraud, even though it's important, because that is part of the expectation. That's primarily we are to give an opinion not to be looking for fraud or the fraudster or error. As important as all these and many more may be, they are secondary to our primary assignment. This knowledge must be given to the clients so that their expectation gap will be reduced. We may not be able to close it but we may reduce it drastically. And now that I mentioned something about fraud, let's quickly look at what fraud is and what error is. Basically, the difference between fraud and error is intention. So when somebody intended or intentionally do something, or use something wrongly, it becomes fraudulent. But if by mistake, if by uh, not intention, not intentional, without intending it, an error happen, or a mistake happen, then we can say it's, it's an error. But the intention when it's intended, it becomes fraudulent. When it's not intended, it's error. But when it's fraudulent, we can equally classify it into two types. We can say it's misappropriation or fraudulent financial reporting. So a fraud can be categorized into misappropriation and fraudulent reporting so what is misappropriation uh, I think uh, here in Nigeria we, we we are used to misappropriation and every, anything can be misappropriated once the intended use is not what we use that thing for that is misappropriation but when it comes to fraudulent financial reporting it takes a higher level of management involvement to have fraudulent financial reporting because fin fraudulent financial reporting cannot happen without somebody's approval without somebody journalizing and things like that but misappropriation can happen at any level but fraudulent financial reporting usually we have a management and in heat like I said, error, they are not intended. Frauds are intended. So when we finally observe fraud during the course of our assignments, what should auditor do? Primarily, when we observe that, we must first of all sit down and analyze to what extent is this fraud what is, is the scope of this fraud we must ask another level of question how does it affect what we had done do we need to do some audit tests again and the like so we must establish that fact its impact on the work we've done and whether we still need to do more to dig deeper into the matter and also we must inform immediately the management team we must carry them along and also we must decide whether we will need to qualify our report if we conclude that the impact is large on 
the financial statement being audited, we may need to qualify our report. And in communicating fraud to the management, we must ensure that we communicate in writing. Our communication to the management must be in writing. We write a report consigning it. As we are rounding up, let's take a look at professional skepticism. Professional skepticism. What is professional skepticism? Professional skepticism is actually about the mindset of a practitioner that questions. It's a questioning mind that asks why. Why is that? When is that? How did that come about? Who did that? For what purpose? So professional mindset should be skeptical about processes to know why something is done and why something is not done. It's not a mindset of disbelief, but it's a mindset that questions. And in questioning, we seek answer. Answer to improve processes. Answer to improve performance. And based on the answer that we get, we are able to propose better processes, amendments, and self our clients better. So that is professional skepticism. So when auditor comes into the organization and they are asking why, give me this, I want evidence of this and this, it's all about the mindset, a trained mindset that asks questions to validate and put reliability upon a piece of information. So for this regulatory environment video, we we'll take a look at the regulatory environment and the work of the regulators like the NSA, ISA, IFAC, IASB, ICANN, FRC and what they do, how we should communicate to those charged with governance, the divorce of power between the management and the ownership of the organization. We've discussed using the work of an expert and we say experts could be auditors experts or management experts. We've taken a look at the meaning of governance and the responsibility of the directors, the responsibility of the auditor, the responsibility of audit committee, composition of audit committee, what they should do, the maximum limit of audit committee, their function, the oversight function. We've looked at the expectation gap. We've looked at responsibility of the auditor, even as to fraud. We've defined what fraud is. We've defined what an error is. We've taken a look at expectation gap and how to close it, the types of expectation gap, the liability gap, the standard gap, and the performance gap. And we've looked at professional skepticism as the mindset that questions. It's not a mindset of disbelief. On this note, Bengal Atunji, I will be signing off. Please don't forget to like us, subscribe to us, and click the notification button so that you can continue to be notified anytime that we are dropping a new video.